what the hell is the difference between penicillin G and penicillin V? So we'll get to that. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, we, uh, we basically addressed the uh, question of what is virulence or pathogenicity. Uh, I'll just briefly mention it. There were some people who weren't here. Uh, I use the terms interchangeably. It's just the capacity of a, a microorganism to injure uh, the body, the tissues of the body. Uh, there are a number of factors that affect the amount of injury caused by the uh, infectious agent, the number of microorganisms, the resistance of the host to the microorganisms, and uh, the resistance is affected by the age. We know that younger children and elderly are more vulnerable. They have a reduced immune response relative to young adults. Uh, the nutritional status, uh, drug abuse like alcoholism tends to reduce the immune response. Very significant, uh, the, lo uh, the location of the infection, some infections may be located in poorly vascularized tissues such as cartilage and therefore it's more difficult for the immune response to reach uh, the site of the infection. Uh, noteworthy corticosteroids and antineoplastic drugs, what are those drugs used for cancer, suppress the immune response. So, uh, and also, also noteworthy, individuals with diabetes have a, a reduced immune response. They are more prone to infection, as we will see yet today, especially things like oral thrush, uh, uh, leukemia, Addison's disease. Addison's disease, you may or may not recall, is a deficiency of glucocorticosteroids. Uh, excess glucocorticosteroids is called Cushing's. And a deficiency is Addison's. Uh, blood dyscrasia, is, uh, that word just means disorders of the blood cells. So when there's uh, abnormalities in red or especially white blood cells, uh, that can uh, lead to uh, reduced immune response. Uh, the, um, at the bottom of the page, uh, so bacterial infections uh, are, can be uh, associated with uh, or bacteria can be associated with dental caries, periodontal disease, and of course systemic infections. On page P2, uh, we reminded you of some of the more significant bacteria that are in the mouth that can cause problems, infections, and uh, these include some uh, anaerobes, and anaerobes probably are, can be potentially a much bigger problem than the aerobes. Uh, okay, antibiotics. So uh, last time uh, we took a quick look at page, um, what is it, page uh, P25. And if we, uh, let's take a quick look at P25 again. And on page P25, so we reminded you of the classic growth curve uh, that you learn about in a microbiology class that uh, when you have a, a growth of bacteria, there's an initial lag phase followed by exponential growth, also known as the logarithmic phase of growth. And then, at least it, when growing bacteria in a culture, in a, on a pet petri dish, uh, so as the resources available to the bacteria uh, are uh, 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 not increased, uh, it, the growth of the bacteria reaches a plateau phase. Anyhow, here's the main point. When you administer an antibiotic during this growth or exponential uh, uh, log phase, uh, if the uh, antibiotic is bacteria static, it simply levels off the growth of the bacteria so there's no further increase in numbers, but it doesn't actually drop the numbers down to zero. Only a bacteriocidal antibiotic. Uh, drops the actual number of bacteria down to zero. So for that reason, we mentioned on Wednesday that uh, a bactericidal antibiotic is going to be preferred over a bacteriostatic antibiotic. Okay, so who's who? So right below on page P25, uh, some examples of bactericidal antibiotics are the penicillins and the cephalosporins. Now penicillins uh, are widely used in dentistry, but in fact, uh, in medicine, probably cephalosporins are used more commonly than penicillins. Uh, an example of a cephalosporin that you may have heard of is Keflex or C-Chlor. We'll give you some examples of those. 
So that make, because these are bactericidal, that means these are going to be, in general, antibiotics of first choice. Uh, baxitracin, polynixin, neomycin are also bactericidal, but as we will see, they are primarily used topically, uh, whereas penicillins and cephalosporins are taken systemically. Uh, now, uh, among the bacteriostatic antibiotics, these include erythromycin and tetracycline. So immediately, because we know it's, they're only bacteriostatic, in general, they're going to be the antibiotics of second choice, not our first choice. As we mentioned last time, so why would we use an antibiotic of second choice? Well, if somebody is allergic to a penicillin, then you've got to give them something, and so they commonly might choose an erythromycin. Now, right below, on the bottom of P25, the mechanisms of antibiotic action. How do antibiotics work? This is a large subject, and we're not going to address this uh, very fully, but let's just get some general ideas. Some of the most important antibiotics work by interfering with the bacterial outer cell wall. They interfere with cell wall synthesis. And these include penicillins and cephalosporins. So since penicillins and cephalosporins are considered two of the most important antibiotics because they're bactericidal, the way they work is they interfere with bacterial cell wall synthesis. You have a, pic a series of uh, pictures of this on the next page. I'm sorry, page P27. If you look on page P27, so this shows on page P27, Uh, it shows a bacillus, bacilli, rod-shaped bacteria, that are uh, administered uh, a penicillin antibiotic. And as it interferes with the cell wall synthesis, their outer cell wall starts to disintegrate, and they start to elongate, and then they just disintegrate, the bacteria cell. So literally, by interfering with that outer rigid cell wall, uh, the bacteria basically self-destruct, uh, and that's really how it works. Now, what's going to be noteworthy, though, is that penicillin and cephalosporins, which work by interfering with the uh, uh, formation, the synthesis of the outer bacterial cell wall, they are only going to be effective against those bacteria that have an outer cell wall. Can you think of any bacteria that don't have an outer cell wall? Mm -hmm. Are there any bacteria that don't have an outer cell wall? Um, well, uh, these include mycoplasma and rickettsiae, mm -hmm. if you might remember those from micro. Mm -hmm. Mycoplasma and rickettsiae are known as intracellular parasitic bacteria. So rather than most bacteria feed on our cells from the outside, uh, but uh, mycoplasma actually enters the inside of our cells, and it has no outer cell wall. So if somebody has a mycoplasma or rickettsial infection, bacteria infection, uh, penicillin will be useless against it. Uh, also on this diagram, uh, there are uh, antifungal antibiotics, and these interfere with the cell membrane or cell wall of fungi. You might recall that the cell membrane and cell wall of a fungus, including yeast, is structurally different than that of a bacteria. It's got chitin and so on. So the um, antifungal antibiotics interfere uh, with the fungal cell wall or cell membrane, and these include nystatin and amphotericin. Again, they would only be effective against a fungal cell uh, membrane or cell wall. Uh, antibiotics that interfere with protein synthesis include erythromycin and tetracyclines. So erythromycin and tetracycline are important antibiotics, and the way they work is they interfere with bacterial protein synthesis. Now remember, they're only bacteriostatic, not bacteriocidal. Uh, a, a couple of other, uh, I'll just mention at least uh, one other, well, two others, 
Uh, there are antibiotics that interfere with uh, in, what's called intermediary metabolism. These include the uh, very famous sulfa antibiotics, the sulfa drugs. And while sulfa drugs are not used as much as they used to, uh, if you've heard of Bactrim or Septra, Bactrim and Septra are still used as a uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, as we'll, we may or may not cover them, they're still commonly used to treat uh, botitis media, middle ear infections, um, and uh, sometimes even urinary tract infections, not so much as they used to. Uh, and uh, these actually interfere with the synthesis of uh, uh, converting uh, well, basically paraminobenzoic acid or PABA. They interfere with that, which is a, a necessary chemical for uh, synthesis of nucleic acids. And then there are some antibiotics that interfere with nucleic acid synthesis, including rifampin. What's rifampin used for? That ring a bell, rifampin? That's an anti-tuberculosis, uh, anti-TB antibiotic. All right, so those are some of the mechanisms of action. Certainly the ones that uh, you should certainly be aware of is how penicillin and cephalosporins work and how erythromycin and tetracyclines work. I think those would be worth knowing. Uh, back on page P2, actually let me just, uh, okay, we'll go back to P2. So back on page P2. So uh, back on page P2, We've mentioned uh, some of the mechanisms of action. We've specifically mentioned that penicillins and cephalosporins interfere with cell wall synthesis of bacteria, and erythromycin and tetracycline interfere with uh, microbial protein synthesis. Now, as all of you well know, uh, one of the major ways of differentiating bacteria is using uh, the gram stain. And so uh, those bacteria that absorb this violet stain are said to be gram uh, positive. Those that do not take up that gram stain are said to be gram negative. Uh, we use the terms regarding antibiotics. Uh, we describe them as broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. And uh, that has to do with uh, how many different types of bacteria it affects. Let's uh, return back to page B, P26. Take a look at page P26. And on the bottom of P26 is a chart and this uh, indicates on the left hand side it lists some antibiotics like penicillins right here on the chart, and it indicates which bacteria penicillins tend to be effective against. And you'll notice that according to this uh, chart, and this is just a, uh, a kind of a, a generic description, uh, not highly detailed, penicillins are effective against Neisseria. Anybody remember what Neisseria is? It causes, among other things, gonorrhea, Neisseria gonococcus, right? Uh, 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 and uh, it's effective against uh, most aerobic or many aerobic gram-positive uh, bacteria, uh, including uh, streptococcus and pneumococcus and spirochetes. Spirochetes are, uh, are the cause of, among other things, uh, there's a spirochete called treponema pallidum that causes syphilis. All right, so uh, penicillins are considered relatively narrow spectrum. There are some antibiotics that are even more narrow spectrum. Look at the bottom one, Nystatin. So Nystatin is only effective against uh, fungi, like Candida. So that's very narrow spectrum. On the other hand, let's look at this one right here, Tetracycline. So you'll notice, according to this chart, that tetracycline can be effective. Now remember, tetracycline is only bacteriostatic, but nevertheless, it may be effective against rickettsiae, against uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria, including uh, 
E. coli and uh, salmonella. Uh, Haemophilus, uh, Neisseria, the uh, gram-positive uh, coxy, and uh, spirochetes. Uh, basically, according to this, the uh, only two things that really tetracycline is not really effective against is Pseudomonas and Mycobacterium tuberculae. So that is an example of a very broad spectrum antibiotic. So we categorize antibiotics based on their spectrum of action. Now back on page P2, so there's a clinical principle. I'm going to tell you what the clinical principle is that all the textbooks say on page P2, and then I'm going to tell you what the reality is. All the textbooks will say that when you have an infection, you should get a culture, you should make a culture of it, find out what the bacteria are in that infection, then do an antibiotic sensitivity test. You've done this all in micro. Find out which antibiotic is most effective against that specific bacteria that's in that causing that infection, and just give that specific antibiotic. Now here's the question. When last time you were at the either the a physi saw a physician or a dentist and you needed an antibiotic, did anybody culture anything? No. They did absolutely nothing. So because they don't, in reality, actually do a culture, and for sure don't do a sensitivity test, they generally tend to give the broadest spectrum antibiotic because they have no idea what the hell it is. <laughs> so I've told you what the textbooks say, and now I've told you what, re what they actually do. Now, they, do, they will try to give the most uh, narrow spectrum, broad spectrum antibiotic. But uh, the less certain they are of what it is, the broader the spectrum antibiotic they will use, because they don't know what it is. All right, another uh, thing I want to address very briefly, you all learned this in micro, is the problem of the development of antibiotic resistance. And uh, there are, uh, how bacteria develop uh, resistance is uh, through genetic uh, mutations, they mutate, and that makes them uh, no longer affected by some antibiotics. There is something called viral transduction. And what viral transduction is, you might recall that there are uh, bacteriophages, or phages, and these are viruses that can actually infect bacteria, and as the virus enters the bacteria, it transfers genetic information into the bacteria, altering the genetic makeup of the bacteria. And the third way that bacteria change and become resistant is through bacterial conjugation. Conjugation is the closest the bacteria get to sex. That's where some bacteria come side by side and they exchange genetic information. So these are the ways that bacteria develop resistance. Now, uh, on page uh, P3, on page P3, so what are some examples? Well, first of all, in terms of the use of antibiotics, there are two major things that tend to promote or encourage uh, resistance to antibiotics, both underutilization and overutilization. We're guilty of both. Uh, and an example of underutilization, and uh, I'm as guilty as anybody. I would admit this. When we're sick and we have, we're given a seven day or 10 day supply of amoxicillin. So we take it for three or four days, we're feeling pretty good, and we set the rest aside for next time we need it. Right? I know you don't do that, but I've done that. <laughs> Probably you've done it too. All right, and so as you know, the first bacteria, when you take an antibiotic, the first bacteria you knock off are the ones that are most vulnerable, most susceptible to the antibiotic. And the ones that are still left in your body, uh, those are the ones you haven't yet killed. So what you've done is you've let the most resistant ones live. So really, the approach you're supposed to use, I call it the general patent approach uh, in the uh, military. You're supposed to use a high initial dose and keep give it, taking that antibiotic. You keep taking it and taking it and taking it until there's technically no bacteria left. 
take no prisoners. Because the, any that you leave left are the ones that are most resistant. So uh, that's what you're supposed to do. So that's why they tell you on the label nowadays, take it until it's all finished. That's what you're supposed to do. All right, but there's also a problem with overutilization, where people use antibiotics not uh, a, a, a too much. And by that, that's when it's used inappropriately. In other words, somebody's got a cold, or they've got a flu, uh, or they've got viral pneumonia. All three of those are caused by viruses. And the person wants an antibiotic, right? And so uh, they, go, they see the doctor. The doctor says, well, you should get plenty of rest. You know, take some, uh, drink some orange juice, uh, take some Tylenol. And they say, I don't get penicillin. Okay, fine, here's some penicillin. All right, so in other words, you're taking an antibiotic when it's not appropriate. And uh, again, we all tend to feel that way. Now, it is true that if you've got a really severe viral, uh, viral infection, it may uh, weaken you and allow, uh, therefore, uh, uh, a promotion of secondary bacterial infections. So if somebody's really weak from a viral infection, they may develop secondary bacterial infections. And in that case, they certainly do need an a bacterial antibiotic. But uh, uh, for a cold, uh, antibiotics are inappropriate for colds, no doubt about it. Okay, now, uh, it, how uh, resistant have some bacteria become? Uh, for a beta hemolytic, hemolytic streptococcus pyogenes infection, which is a cause of sore throat or pharyngitis, right, strep throat, you should take the antibiotic for 10 days to knock it out. For a staph, staph infection, which could be the cause of osteomyelitis, uh, because so many staph have become resistant to so many different an uh, antibiotics, you should hit it for two weeks to knock it out. Because they're just, do we really want to make sure that we're killing off all the staph because, and not encouraging proliferation of the more resistant strains? For a streptococcus viridens infections, which uh, can be uh, associated with bacterial endocarditis, uh, and as uh, what happens in rheumatic heart disease, you take it for a month. And of course, I didn't write it down, but if you've got tuberculosis, how long do you have to be on antibiotics for tuberculosis? Nine yeah, nine, ten months, right, to knock it out. Otherwise, just don't knock it out. All right, uh, as far as the adverse reactions, what are the major side effects or adverse reactions associated with antibiotics? The most common that it, most people experience is GI uh, problems, including nausea, cramps, and diarrhea. It is very common for people to take an antibiotic and feel very nauseous and uh, get cramps. And uh, it's not surprising why. Uh, antibiotics are killing bacteria. They're killing bad bacteria, and they're killing good bacteria that are in your intestinal tract. So they are altering or changing your natural bacterial flora of your digestive tract. And no wonder that might upset your whole GI system. Uh, also, some bacteria are, are, are allergenic. In fact, the most allergenic medicines that are commonly taken by patients include antibiotics. About 8% uh, of the U.S. population, 8% of the U.S. population is allergic to penicillin. About 5% of the uh, U.S. population is allergic to cephalosporins. There is a high proportion, and I don't know the percent uh, I'm going to write down. It's about 5% or maybe even higher. 5% allergic to sulfa drugs or sulfa antibiotics. So these are among the most common medicines that people take that people also happen to be allergic to. <clears throat> and there are direct toxic effects. Uh, the most common toxic effects caused by bacteria, I'm sorry, caused by antibiotics, I should say, is that some antibiotics are ototoxic and nephrotoxic. What 
What's odo mean? Ear. Ear. So in other words, some antibiotics damage, they are toxic or damage the cochlea, the structure the, associated with hearing. And uh, uh, the cochlear nerve fibers, for some reason, and some, if people take, especially children, who are given very high levels of some antibiotics, sometimes because of, uh, let's say, bacterial spinal meningitis or something like that, uh, it may, they may develop deafness and they become deaf. Um, and uh, many antibiotics uh, can be nephrotoxic. They can damage the kidney. And uh, the ones that especially tend to be nephrotoxic are penicillins and cephalosporins because they are actively transported out of the bloodstream by the kidneys, and they tend to be nephrotoxic. Another, uh, another uh, problem with antibiotics, besides GI irritation, allergic reactions, and being ototoxic or nephrotoxic, is if they are broad-spectrum antibiotics, they so much alter the bacterial flora of the body that they uh, permit or allow opportunistic secondary infections. These opportunistic secondary infections are sometimes known as super infections. Uh, and a couple of ex quick examples. Uh, people who take penicillin, let's say you're taking a penicillin to knock out a strep streptococcal infection, uh, may develop opportunistic staph infections because when the strep are destroyed, uh, staph, st uh, which is normally inhibited in part by strep, uh, start to uh, multiply. Tetracycline, we saw as a very broad spectrum antibiotic, effective against almost all bacteria. So what tends to develop is opportunistic secondary yeast infections, all right, when people are on these really broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, uh, antibiotics are used in the treatment of infections. And sometimes they're also used to prevent for the prophylaxis of infections. Now, in general, uh, doctors and dentists don't give you an antibiotic because you might get sick. You don't call up the doctor and say, uh, you know, I might get sick today. Can you give me an antibiotic? No, they'll say, after you're sick, we'll give you, we'll give you an antibiotic. But there are some individuals where they have suppressed immune responses, where they may be given antibiotics prophylactically or preventatively. Uh, elderly individuals uh, who have uh, reduced immune responses. On the next page, patients on immunosuppressant drugs. Can anybody remember what's an example of an immunosuppressant drug? Corticosteroids. That one you should know. Corticosteroids, like prednisone, suppress the immune response. Now, sometimes they specifically use it to suppress the immune response. That's why they're given to people with organ transplants or autoimmune diseases. But uh, they may be taking it as an anti-inflammatory drug. And uh, whatever, it's going to lower the lymphocyte count. Uh, chemotherapeutic drugs for cancer tend to suppress the immune response. And uh, also, before people have uh, uh, bowel surgery, uh, before they open up their digestive tract, the lower, uh, uh, the lower um, intestine, large intestine. So, you know, when you open up the large intestine, you always allow the possibility of bacteria in the large intestine to enter the abdominal cavity, so they will commonly give them antibiotics even before they, the surgery. Of course, we also uh, know that in the past, they have given antibiotics prophylactically uh, for those individuals who have, uh, are prone to rheumatic heart disease. Uh, that's no longer uh, required, uh, although there are still dentists, I think, still giving antibiotics uh, for people with a history of rheumatic heart disease, but the American Heart Association and the law books no longer require that you give uh, antibiotics prophylactically. I want to emphasize, though, that the concern for rheumatic heart disease is, uh, includes endocarditis and uh, history of rheumatic fever, prosthetic heart valves. It does not include coronary artery disease. So the clogging up of your coronary arteries with uh, a, a, a cholesterol, that is not considered the same as, uh, a, uh, uh, of, uh, as endocarditis or uh, prosthetic heart valves. 
So you should know that distinction. So not every heart problem is, uh, is uh, considered uh, a, a risk factor for uh, rheumatic heart disease. Uh, a history of uh, lupus or transplanted organs or prosthetic joints, uh, including uh, a prosthetic uh, uh, hip joint, uh, that may also uh, uh, be a, a factor, a risk factor, uh, necess necessitating uh, either prophylactic use of antibiotics or at least uh, being cautious in terms of uh, certain procedures. They will also give antibiotics prophylactically in individuals with extensive burns on the body because we know the very first line of defense against bacteria is the skin as a mechanical barrier. And when somebody has ex suffered extensive burns, they've lost the first line of defense. Uh, and uh, certain systemic diseases, uh, individuals with uh, very severe diabetes uh, have a reduced immune response and then they need to get antibiotics prophylactically. All right, uh, and uh, okay, this was the, uh, pr uh, the previous antibiotic pro prophylaxis regimen. Uh, they used to require amoxicillin, and if you were allergic to amoxicillin, clindamycin, uh, but uh, I, we used to actually make dental uh, hygiene students memorize the regimen, but since it's no longer required, uh, we don't make you memorize it anymore. I don't, did you have to do that for any other class? Did they still mm -hmm. make you memorize it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I, I'm, I'm not asking you to, but... Um, okay, uh, we'll talk about more of these. On uh, page P5, on page P5, so uh, now that we've given you the background, we want to focus on uh, just a few uh, types of antibiotics because of time. The first are the penicillins. So uh, the prototype, the prototypical penicillin is penicillin G. And uh, its chemical name is benzyl penicillin. You don't have to know that. But benzyl penicillin is the name of the chemical that is extracted from the mold Penicillium notatum. So the classic chemical that was extracted from this mold, called the penicillium mold, is called penicillin G, or benzo penicillin. Um, okay, let's see what that looks like. Let's look on page P27. See page P27, and we're going to show you the structure of penicillin G. All right. So on the lower half of page P27, this is the basic structure of a penicillin molecule. And you know, to me, you know what it looks like? If this is the basic structure of penicillin, it looks like a house with an attached garage. <laughs> So it's a penicillin molecule, looks like a house with an attached garage. And then what is attached to the garage is called a side chain. All right, this is the side chain. Now, penicillin G, or benzopenicillin, this is the side chain that is attached to the garage. All right, so that's the actual chemical that comes from the mold. Now, what we're going to be seeing very shortly is that they have taken the side chain and modified it. And when they modify the side chain, it cha they can change it from what's called penicillin G to penicillin V. Does everybody see this? Penicillin V, or phenoxyl, phenoxymethyl penicillin, has a slightly different side chain attached to the attached garage. All right, now I'm not asking you to know the chemical structure. I'm trying to explain something. So the basic structure of all penicillins, penicillin G, penicillin V, amoxicillin, ticarcillin, they all have this uh, house with a garage. But how they vary is what's attached to it. And that changes Part of their pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. It changes their spectrum of action and their pharmacokinetics. 
All right, let's go back to page P5. So, back on page P5, so how do, what's the pharmacodynamics? How does penicillin, all penicillins work? They interfere with bacterial cell wall synthesis. They actually interfere with an enzyme called transpeptidase, and they are bactericidal. They interfere with bacterial cell wall synthesis. Now, what is, uh, we've explained what the classic penicillin uh, G, what it looks like. What, it, what is its spectrum of action? So penicillin G is the antibiotic of first choice, assuming you're not allergic to it, for uh, strep infections, streptococcal infections, including strep throat, uh, pneumococcus, and Vincent's gingivitis, pharyngitis, and for treponema pallidum, uh, the spirochete that's responsible for syphilis. All right, so in other words, it's used for strep infections and syphilis, basically. Now, penicillin G is given by injection. It is not usually given orally. Why not? Because if you take it orally, most of it is inactivated by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And as far as, as far as adverse effects, a lot of people are allergic to penicillin, as we've said, and penicillin can be nephrotoxic, can damage the kidney. And chronic use of penicillin can lead to black hairy tongue. Okay, on page P6, now, uh, penicillin, uh, penicillin G, which is given by injection, they commonly still express is its dosage in what are called USP units. USP stands for United States Pharmacopeia. Remember that? So there, it is expressed in uh, USP units. So the typical dose of penicillin G that's injected is they typically give 400,000 to 800,000 USP units. That is equivalent, and you don't have to know this, I used to make my students learn it, I don't think it's important, but this is the conversion factor 1,600 USP units is equal to one milligram of penicillin G. So 400,000 USP units is about 250 milligrams, and 800,000 would be 500 milligrams. So the typical dose is 250 to 500 milligrams of penicillin G, but that's usually expressed in USP units. All right, now, uh, they have some other, and again, penicillin G is injected. So this is not what the dentist is prescribing. We'll get to that in a moment. But all of us at one time or another have gotten a shot in our butt of penicillin. And that was probably, nobody ever got that? Just out of curiosity, who, who got a shot in their butt of penicillin G? All right. All right, so uh, anyhow. They do have some longer acting penicillin Gs that can be injected, including, I'll just mention penicillin, you don't have to know this, penicillin G benze, benzathine, which goes under the brand name Bacillin ALA. Now, Bacillin LA does not mean Bacillin Los Angeles, it means long acting. <laughs> it also goes under the brand name Permapen. And what they do when they give you an injection, intramuscular injection into the gluteus medius muscle of penicillin G benzathine is it provides a low level of penicillin in your bloodstream for 21 days. So that's what they mean by long acting LA. And uh, this is why they sometimes want to give these uh, long duration. Usually they don't give the long duration. 
because the, what they classically used to do is they'd give a shot of penicillin and then they'd give you some to take at, by mouth when you get home. All right? But they'd at least get it started immediately, right, with the shot. Uh, the, uh, why they would give these long duration ones is let's imagine you're working at the uh, LA Free Clinic and somebody comes in and it, they're diagnosed as having syphilis. All right? Now, you, if you hand him some pills and you look at that person, you've got to ask yourself, are, do you trust them to take their penicillin four times a day to knock out their syphilis? Because remember, they're having sex with other people in the meantime. <laughs> Since you probably don't trust this individual to remember to take their penicillin and they've got an active case of syphilis, we're just going to give them permapen. Okay, so they've got penicillin for 21 days in their bloodstream. And we don't have to worry about giving them any pills to take. You got the idea? That's what they do. Now, penicillin G, we said, is given by injection because if you take it orally, most of it is broken down by hydrochloric acid. So, they developed what's called penicillin V. Penicillin V is Phenoxymethyl penicillin. It is semi synthetic. If you're wondering, so what did they do? They took the original penicillin, remember the house with the attached garage and this side chain? And they modified the side chain from this to this. This is called penicillin V, and this one can be taken orally. So G is given by injection, V is given orally. It is not broken down by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So you might say, did you say that? Yes, I did. On page P6, we wrote that it's acid stable. It is the same spectrum of action as penicillin G, but you can take it orally. So this is available for oral administration. On page P7, on P7, a typical dose of penicillin V, which doctors prescribe and so do dentists, is either 250 to 500 milligrams of potassium penicillin V. And it's just a potassium salt of penicillin V. Uh, and that's usually taken uh, three or four times a day. We'll say. Uh, TID. Right, so whether they take it three times a day or four times a day. That's typical dose. All right, and it goes by all these different brand names. And you probably have heard of V-Cillin Potassium or Pen VK or Pfizer Pen VK. These are just all different brand names. Now, to help us keep track of this, let's look on page P9. So on page P9 at the bottom half of the page, I made a little chart. So we can keep ourselves, uh, see what's going on here. So if somebody's got strep throat, they've got strep throat or they've got a VD infection. That's the old name for, you know, sexually transmitted diseases, but they've got a sexually transmitted bacterial infection, either gonococcus or uh, syphilis, treponema. So they're going to take either penicillin G They'll either get penicillin G by injection or penicillin V orally. And obviously, in terms of uh, the dentist, the cons the, what they're we're usually most commonly worried about is strep throat, strep infections. So they get penicillin V. Have you seen penicillin V prescribed by dentists? Anybody? Nobody? Yeah. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, now, uh, let's go back to uh, page, uh, wherever we were, uh, page P7. Now, on page P7, all of you have learned that when they first introduced penicillin, penicillin G and then V, in the 1940s, it worked against staph. 
Within 10 years after the introduction of penicillin in the 1940s, by the 1950s, they were noticing increasing strains of Staphylococcus aureus, staph infections, that were resistant to penicillin. And we know that why they're resistant is they produce some mutated, they, they have an enzyme called penicillinase, or beta-lactamase, we'll call penicillinase, and this enzyme that is produced by uh, Staphylococcus bacteria, in fact, today, 90% of the staph infections produce this enzyme called penicillinase. And you know what penicillinase actually does? The way that penicillinase works is this enzyme produced by staph bacteria actually break the house. <laughs> they actually break the house apart. Remember, there's a house with the attached garage and the side chain. So that's how they work. They rupture the penicillin molecule, so the penicillin molecule can't uh, 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 harm them. So the bacteria, the Staphylococcus bacteria, go nin, 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 and, 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 and the penicillin doesn't work. So what they did is they said, you know what? Let's change, let's modify this penicillin molecule and see if we can't make it so that that penicillinase enzyme won't work against it. And they did. And the very first one of these penicillinase resistant penicillins that they developed was called methicillin. It's right here. So the very first penicillinase resistant penicillin they developed was called methicillin. And in fact, it went under brand names like Staphcillin. Does Staphcillin sound like it would be used against Staph? <laughs> now, the problem is, we have started to see over the last 10, 15 years, increasing numbers of Staphylococcus bacterial infections that have become resistant to methicillin. What do we call them? MRSA. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus infections. So a MRSA infection, a MRSA infection is a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus infection. So they were using methicillin against it. And now they've started to see that even methicillin won't work against it. So everybody follow this? So now you know the history of how it got the name MRSA because they had developed a special penicillin against it. Now there was a whole bunch of these penicillinase resistant penicillins. Methicillin was the first one and there were a whole bunch of others. Some were taken parenterally by injection and some were taken orally, including stuff called cloxicillin and dicloxicillin and I don't know if anybody ever heard of those. All right, so let's uh, keep track of this. Let's go to page P9. On page P9, in terms of our chart. So if you have a staph infection, most staph was treated with methicillin. Now we do know that some methicillin, which is a penicillin, that was effective against staph, we now know that some staph bacteria are even resistant against methicillin. Not the majority. That's why we talk specifically about a MRSA infection. Again, most staph infections can be knocked out with methicillin, but we do know that there are a small percent of methicillin-resistant staph infections today. <clears throat> so methicillin was used. Now, methicillin is, is specifically used against staph infections. It is actually not as effective against strep as good old regular penicillin G or V. But if it is a staph infection, they would use methicillin. Okay, obviously they won't use methicillin if it's a MRSA infection. All right, now, I'll go just a, a drop further. Back on page P7, P7. So remember we had talked about how they could take this house and garage and modify the side chain? So they modified the side chain some more and they found that they were able to extend the spectrum of action. 
so that the penicillin would be effective against a broader uh, spectrum of, of bacteria. These are called extended spectrum penicillins or amino penicillins. And our prototype that you should know is amoxicillin. So amoxicillin has a broader spectrum of action than penicillin G or B. It is effective against aerobic, not only aerobic gram-positive coxy, which includes strep, but it's also effective against aerobic gram-negative bacilli, including E. coli. E. coli is a gram-negative bacillus. So that's what amoxicillin is. Amoxicillin is actually what is now part of the protocol for uh, uh, prophylaxis, when they do do prophylaxis uh, for uh, rheumatic heart disease, uh, bacterial endocarditis. They use amoxicillin. It is, uh, it is uh, used for respiratory tract infections. It is commonly given uh, uh, for urinary tract infections uh, because many urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli. All right, now on P8, on P8, the, uh, one of the problems that can happen with a uh, amoxicillin is because it has a broader spectrum of action. Not only is it effective in killing strep, uh, but also gram aerobic gram-negative bacilli, is that because it alters the flora, the bacterial flora of the body uh, quite a bit, uh, it allows uh, a secondary, opportunistic secondary infections to occur. Now, uh, there are a bunch of other extended spectrum penicillins besides amoxicillin, including ampicillin and uh, bacampicillin or spectrobid and a whole bunch of others. All right, let's try to get a handle on that on page P9, on page P9. So what if you've got a mixed aerobic infection? Our first thought is, what does that mean? That means it's aerobic bacteria, but it includes both gram-positive coxy, like strep, as well as gram-negative bacilli, maybe such as E. coli. So in that case, what do they give? Amoxicillin. Now, amoxicillin is actually what's given orally. I'm not going to ask you to know this, but if uh, what they give is ampicillin, ampicillin uh, by injection. You don't have to know that. But I want to remind you that while amoxicillin has this broader spectrum of action, it does not work against staph. The only one that works against staph is methicillin, unless it's a methicillin-resistant staph. The problem is, as we started out saying, most doctors, most physicians and dentists, when you have an infection, they don't bother to find out what the bacteria are. And because it is very not uncommon for staph to be part of that mixture of bad guys that are causing the infection, because staph is pretty pervasive. Remember, penicillin uh, 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 G, penicillin V, amoxicillin doesn't work against staph. So in order to knock out any staph that is in a mixed aerobic infection, they developed, and you've all heard of it, augmentin. What is augmentin? So, We'll come back to that chart, but on page P8. So on page P8, so on page P8, they developed what are known as penicillinase inhibitors, or beta-lactamase inhibitors. Now our first thought is, what? What did we say staph bacteria produce that stops penicillins from being effective against it? They produce an enzyme called penicillinase. So they said, let's find a drug that stops their secret uh, enzyme, penicillinase, from working. 
So if we can stop the penicillinase enzyme that these bacteria are producing from working, then the penicillin will kill them. So right now, the, so, uh, the, the name of the drug that they use is called clavulanate. Clavulanic acid or clavulanate inhibits the penicillinase. This makes the penicillin effective against staph. So just as a way of helping you remember this, you give the person, let's say you give the person uh, amoxicillin. Now we said amoxicillin doesn't work against staph. So you give them amoxicillin. There's some staph there and they produce penicillinase enzyme and they're going, nah, 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 you can't hurt us. But you've combined with the amoxicillin clavulanate. Clavulanate stops the penicillinase enzyme from working so that the amoxicillin will kill the staph. So, the pen so this combination goes na 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 to the <laughs> staph infection. So in other words, the reason why they call it augmented is it's amoxicillin augmented or enhanced with clavulanate. All right, so basically what augmentin is, is amoxicillin plus clavulanate, which makes it effective against staph. So let's go to our chart on P9. Make sure we got a hand on it. So what do we give somebody? If they have a mixed aerobic infection, but it also includes staph, you give augmentin. What is augmentin? Augmentin is amoxicillin plus clavulanate. So what does that mean? That means that it's like amo it's got amoxicillin in it, so it's effective against mixed aerobic infections. But because they've added, they've augmented it with clavulanate, it also works against staph as well. So the, uh, and if, if you've ever had uh, augmentin, it is like a fantastic antibiotic. Because uh, there, there's, it's very common to have staph infections. That as, when you have a mixed aerobic infection, it's not uncommon to have some staph in there mixed in. So, uh, the, uh, so let's summarize before we take a break. So uh, the original penicillin was G or V. You know, G is given by injection, V is taken orally. That's good against strep, and it's good against gonorrhea and syphilis. All right? If you, originally, if you just have staph, then they'd give methicillin. But it doesn't work so good against anything other than staph. Uh, the problem is, very commonly, you've got a mixed aerobic infection that might include strep, and it might include staph, and it might be a whole mixture of stuff. If you give them amoxicillin, it will work against strep and even E. coli and other aerobic bacteria, but it will work against staph. But by adding clavulanate, uh, that's called augmentin, now it'll work even against staph in that mixed aerobic infection. Uh, back on page uh, P8. So on page P8, they were having so much fun modifying the penicillin molecule that they modified it further into what are called new broad spectrum or third generation penicillins like t -carcillin. And by modifying the penicillin molecule, now it works not only against uh, aerobic bacteria, but even anaerobic bacteria, including bacterioides. So these are very broad spectrum uh, penicillins that even work effective against anaerobes. So uh, on page P9, on page P9, at the top of P9, they also have a T. carcillin containing clavulanate. And what that means is that it works against aerobic bacteria and anaerobic bacteria, and because it's got clavulanate, it even works against staph. So let's write that into our chart. So if you've got a mixed aerobic and anaerobic bacterial infection, what do they give? T. carcillin 
It is a penicillin, T. carcillin, even a broader spectrum of action. But remember, you have to give T. carcillin plus clavulanate in order to be effective against if it's got staph in there. All right, so if you've got anaerobes, uh, then you use T-carcillin, it's even a broader spectrum of action, but you've got to add clavulanate to make it work against staph. Does that help clarify the penicillins? It's a whole family. If you're allergic to one, you're allergic to all of them. But now you know what penicillin B is, what amoxicillin is, what augmentin is, and you probably won't run into T-carcillin or T-carcillin with clavulanate, but it can be used in a hospital setting.